So, Killers of the Flower Moon has just come out, the new film by Martin Scorsese, and I know recently I've been talking, I've been doing some videos about, you know, talking about directors, I've done a couple rankings for Wes Anderson and Christopher Nolan, and I went over Spielberg's entire filmography, but Scorsese, I still have yet to see every single film this man has made. Like, Silent, I think, is the biggest Scorsese film that I still have yet to see. And also, like, Age of Innocence and Cundin. So instead, I'm just gonna say my top 10 favorite Martin Scorsese films. And, uh, if you wanna know, like, how, where I would have other films, uh, I'm gonna put the... Uh, 10, I'm gonna put 11 through 5 in the link below so you can see uh, the Scorsese films that I that I kind of like but they just weren't they didn't make it on the list so let's get right into it with number 10 so coming at number 10 we have Casino so five years uh, after not making a uh, another gangster film after Goodfellas with uh, De Niro and Pesci uh, Scorsese De Niro and Pesci they reunite to make Casino and uh, yeah, it really, I don't think it's as good as Goodfellas. And I know people say uh, they they like it better. They think the casino industry is better. But the reason why I like Goodfellas is because you know I feel like I got a lot more connections to Goodfellas because it's more in New York. And this is in Las Vegas. I never been to Nevada. Um, I don't really know if I am even interested in like gambling and casinos. It's just something I don't care for. But at the same time, that's not to say that the direction from Scorsese and like the acting from De Niro, Pesci, uh, Sharon Stone, James Woods, and Don Rickles, that's to say they're not good. They're, they're fantastic. This is like, this is definitely like a great Scorsese cast. Um, I just, I know it's at number 10, um, but it's not one of my favorites, but it does have a lot good in it. Should I qualify it to be like, I think a little bit better than some other Scorsese films, like the ones I have down the link. So that says something about Casino, but not as good as others. It's just really, it's just got some decent stuff. Uh, so coming in number nine is After Hours. Uh, so After Hours, uh, this is the second dark comedy that uh, Scorsese directed after The King of Comedy. It stars uh, Griffin Dune, who um, uh, played Jack in uh, American Werewolf in London, the, the one that gets killed by the werewolf in the beginning and comes back as a ghost. Uh, it's about him basically getting to all these hijinks uh, late at night, and I, I think it's Soho, New York. I forgot where in New York he is, but he's basically up all night in this area of New York that he just can't seem to get out of. Uh, and this film is famously going to be um, directed by Tim Burton at first. This would have been Tim Burton's directorial debut, but uh, Scorsese um, was asked to do it first, but he had to turn it down because uh, I think he was going to do Last Temptation of Christ, but the studio shut it down. And then um, Tim Burton was supposed to come on, but then Scorsese's like, hey, I like the script, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So Tim Burton uh, kicked off the project, and then uh, ended up do directing uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, uh, which I haven't seen. Uh, but you know, I think um, I guess both. I, I guess both directors got it good this year. They made two uh, comedy classics, and uh, I think After Hours. It's just a very fun comedy. Uh, I like the actors. You know, Griffin Dune, uh, Patricia Arquette. Uh, both Home Alone parents are in it. Um, and uh, Linda Ferentino from Men in Black. I like her uh, little quirky performance. Uh, it's overall, it's just a very, uh, it's a Scorsese, uh, following up on King of Comedy, and maybe even dialing up the quirky darkness that this film is. And I, I enjoy it, that's all, all I can say. It's, uh, it's one of the few different types of uh, Scorsese films that, even when I'm thinking about like I, I don't think of After Hours like, like it doesn't come off as like a Scorsese film. It just it feels like another one of those like funny comedies from the '80s, and uh, that's really about it. So coming in at number eight, we have the Last Temptation of Christ. At the time, this was Martin's most controversial film. 
so controversial the fact that he had to have bodyguards with him for like I think every event related to this movie or maybe at all times and uh, it's kind of funny though I, I, I think like I don't know if it was the passion of the Christ that like replaced it or just time overall like no one really knows about this movie that much like I think Pat like maybe passion just sticks out more just because of how like like maybe passion was like a lot more controversial uh, because of the director of you know how he because uh, the things he said afterwards and I guess more what it depicted uh, but this movie did get like protests from the church and it was really bad and now I don't think that many people remember it and like this like like when you think of Scorsese you know people are always talking about uh, Goodfellas, uh, Raging Bull, King of Comedy, Taxi Driver, The Departed. Uh, but this one never gets brought into to the um, in the conversation because this is a really good movie. Uh, I love the performances from both uh, Willem Dafoe, uh, Harvey Keitel, uh, Harry Dean Stanton, and David Bowie, who's in the movie for like like a minute. But I actually think he is like he's, he's pretty good in the few moments he ha he's got. The, the script is good, it's, uh, him and Paul Strader teaming up again, and they've written uh, another really great movie. Uh, I like, you know, how they retell the story of Jesus in the, in the traditional uh, way that Scorsese likes to tell his characters, is to make them feel like regular human beings like us. He shows that Jesus, even if he was this, like, god, he was just a person, just like of all, like all of us, who fell into temptation, and it's a terrific uh, portrayal. Only problem with this movie is that I wish, I wish it got a maybe like a bigger budget, because this movie at times it kind of feels very cheap in its production design. I don't like the look of the Roman soldiers. Uh, I don't really like. I mean, maybe like just like going to church uh, as a kid, you know, like and like you know, well, like communion school. I I always kind of thought like I'm, I'm I don't like the how like the crucifix looks like because you know it's not the proper crucifix look. So I was kind of I didn't really like that, but overall I like the story of uh, Jesus in this, and uh, it's kind of interesting how this movie was very controversial, and now it's just completely forgotten today. Alright, so coming in at number 7 we have Taxi Driver. Uh, what some might say is like Scorsese's first masterpiece and uh, when I first saw this movie I didn't really like it when it came out but uh, after rewatching it again you know with Killers of Moon coming out uh, I thought I, I think it's really good. Um, I love, I think I, I get the story a lot more now, because it's just, it's just really about this guy who was just a part of this, this like scum, gritty, dirty New York City system of like, you know, the jobs that, that, that you know, like create the city and the, the fact that he like hates it uh, just kind of shows like, like how he's not, he's not really doing much about it until the end. But at the same time, though, as much as he hates New York City, he is just being, like, sucked into a part of the system of New York City by going to stuff like adult cinemas and and just kind of, like, stalking people. So it's definitely a, a movie that's disturbing, uh, but there's definitely a good message in there about, like, if, you know, when you think, like, nothing around you is good or being done, uh, actually do, do something about it. And, uh, and if you think there's something wrong, fix it. And the, I think overall, the, the, the writing again from Paul Schrader, the, the acting from, like, De Niro, uh, Harvey Keitel, uh, the young Jodie Foster, and that, um, and that, like, I forgot, I, I, for, I don't know her name, it's the, the, the blonde girl that, he, that he's into, uh, the camera work from Scorsese, the editing from, uh, I believe, George Lucas's wife at the time, Marsha. It's very impressive for the 1970s. It's definitely one of the best films of the 70s. Uh, I would watch Taxi Driver 
Uh, if you don't like it at first, you just need to give it a few more watches and then you will actually get it why this movie is really good. Coming in at number six is the uh, was is the next uh, film that Scorsese and Paul Schrader wrote together, uh, Raging Bull. Uh, this was uh, the first time, I think this was the very first film that he made with Joe Pesci. Uh, yeah, it, it was. Uh, and uh, first time seeing De Niro and Pesci. I mean, I think in every four, in all the four movies they are, they're together, their their chemistry is always great. And especially in this one is like definitely the most powerful because the because they're both brother ass, you know, they're both brothers. And uh, for a, for a guy who didn't like care for boxing, it definitely shows that he really he'll he he will look into the character to that person and uh, just tell the story because that's what I like about this movie. You don't really you don't like Jake LaMotta, and at the same time, you don't really hate Jake LaMotta. You just think. Lamada is just such a sad, sad figure. And uh, when you're at the end, you just you feel nothing. There's just nothing but like sadness. You just feel at the end, like this is just how far like a hero can fall. And this was this was definitely like at one point my favorite Scorsese film when I first watched it because I thought like everything about it was just so deep and like dark. In a, in a way that's not so dramatic. Which is what I like from a drama sometimes. Like, I like when a drama isn't being so overly dramatic. It's just it's just showing this man who used to be a huge celebrity just fall because of his, like, aggression, uh, his choices, and his just, like, demise as a boxer to a failing comedian who's just overweight. And, uh... It's amazing, the directing from Scorsese is amazing, the black and white aesthetics, which I think they, I think the black and white was just to like differentiate it from uh, Rocky, and I think Erwin Winkler, the producer of Rocky, is like a producer on this movie, so uh, you can definitely say like he had some like, he definitely pulled some strings back there to make sure I didn't resemble Rocky in any way. And no, I, if you were going to ask if I've seen Grudge Match, no, I haven't seen Grudge Match. I'm interested in watching it whenever I'm doing like another like Rocky Creed binge. Um, and the uh, the acting from both um, Robert De Niro, who uh, definitely deserved the Oscar because this is definitely like one of his best performances. Uh, I'm gonna quickly spoil. I I think maybe I like his performance in King of Comedy a little bit better, but I can understand like if you wanted to say this is his best performance because. It's definitely like top three for me, like my favorite De Niro performances. Uh, Joe Pesci, he, I think, he also he should have won with the with De Niro because as a supporting role, it's definitely a uh, a great like just supporting character and uh, and someone at the end you just you kind of just feel terrible that um, you you really hate to just see these like brothers like come apart like that just at the end. And also, I forgot her name, I'll put her name somewhere, the, 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 the girl. Oh, I'm, I just realized, how am I forgetting, like, love interests for the De Niro in these movies? Uh, Jake LaMotta's wife. Wait, it's coming to me. What's her name again? Uh, whatever. Uh, Jake LaMotta's wife, she act, that actress does a really good job, even though she does not look 15 uh, when we first meet her. Even though she was, like, I think she actually was, like, 20. Maybe night night and night nineteen when she made this movie. Uh, but great film, great direction and acting and writing, and also should have won best picture. Coming in at number five, uh, this is probably gonna get some people mad that I put this over Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and maybe even Last Temptation of Christ and Casino. That is Gangs of New York. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people either, they don't care about this movie, they either don't really like the movie, they hate it. I don't really know what the consensus is because I, now I think I, I know a lot of people though that, like, that love it, but I'm talking like film enthusiasts, I don't think they seem to care for it. Even though I think this was like a pretty big movie when it came out with like awards and I think, you know, box office it was a hit. But I don't think a lot of people talk about it and they just don't, 
it, it, I, it's definitely his most underrated film, and it's sad that no one like no one puts Gangs in New York um, up there with like Goodfellas, The Raging Bull, and Taxi Driver, because this is an amazing film. Uh, maybe some of the editing isn't great, uh, but the performances from DiCaprio and Daniel Day Lewis, uh, Jim Bordent, who's great, who's like it's actually really funny in the movie. Um, the Elliot from E.T. is in it. He's pretty good in his scenes. Um, and, but then, yeah, Cameron Diaz, it's definitely, when you see Cameron Diaz in the movie, it's just like, okay, what is she doing in this movie? I mean, she might be the weakest actress in the movie, but it's not a bad performance. Like, I don't think there's, like, people say DiCaprio's not good in this movie, and I, I don't know. Like, I, I like DiCaprio in this movie. He's not as good as Day Lewis. Day Lewis, like, steals the show. I like him in it, and I, uh, the production design, like, like, the fact that all of this was, like, not CGI at all was, is very impressive compared to his next film, The Aviator, which is just, feels like it's mostly CGI, just from, like, green screens. Um, this is definitely one of, I, I, you, you gotta admit, this is one of his most technological, like, like, this is one of his best, like, technical movies. And, uh... For, and it just tells a really good story about like fighting for the streets and what it means to be American and Chris Hensley just does a great job and with help of the writer from Schindler's List, it was a great movie about immigrants fighting the natives. And look, it's awesome guys. And it's got Giants John C. Riley too in it. So it's got a lot that you want out of a movie. So coming in at number four is the king of comedy, uh, Scorsese's first uh, dark comedy, and yeah, this is just a really funny, almost like sad and uncomfortable movie to watch. Um, that's it's just a great movie though about like you know to to I, you either be this like schmuck who gets nowhere in life or break the rules and be a king for just one night of your life. And uh, this is way better than Joker in a lot of ways. Uh, this is just, it's just, the, the direction the direction that Scorsese does, uh, the, the acting from De Niro is amazing. Like the way he acts, you, you feel sad for him and you, uh, and you, but and you deep down you want to see the, him like strive as this like comedy like Jerry Lewis, like Jerry Lewis's character, and and you just kind of always feel sad to see him as this like guy who lives in his mom's basement, and it's just always um, always have it's always daydreaming about talking with Jerry at lunch, and trying to get the girl of his dreams. It's it's something you feel sad for, but then when you see him like truly rise to what he can actually be and does what he does to just get the spotlight. It definitely is something that could inspire you, maybe not to kidnap people, but to just show you that if you if you press through enough, you can still achieve what you want and just be a king for one night. And it's just a truly amazing film. Uh, there are some problems though. The, um, I, I think... Uh, I think at times I was a little confused, like when something was a, was like a you know a dream, like imagination of Rupert, and when um, you know some, and when it was not, like the scene when uh, Jerry and his like girlfriend character goes to like Jerry's house. Uh, I, I thought um, I thought it was a daydream at first, but no, it, but then it's like explained that it isn't, and it's it's just it's it's an just amazing. Uh, Dark comedy, it's probably one of the best dark comedies ever made. Uh, not just from the 80s, just in general. And, uh, I would definitely give this a watch if you watched Joker like 60 times already. So. So number three uh, would be his, like, crowning achievement when it comes to the Oscars. And that is The Departed. Um, another Scorsese film that I feel like, I mean, 
I know a lot of people that love this movie, and then there are a lot of people that are like, well, it's like his eighth best movie. It's not that good. No. It's awesome. It's like, like, I want to say to people who don't like this movie, it's just like, what? Why? Why do you not like this movie? This is like one of his best acted movies, one of his maybe like best written movies, better, like one of his best directed movies, and just like a movie that just makes you go like, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just, look, people you need to stop, people I don't think, some people don't get it. I have friends who don't like this movie. Something is wrong with them. Because the, the story, like, the fact that Scorsese, he is remaking this, like, foreign film, and this is, like, when remaking foreign films, like, The Ring and Grudge is, like, the thing to do. And the fact that Scorsese doesn't, doesn't even watch the original, uh, it definitely shows that he wanted to, like, make his own movie without seeing, like, the other source material. So you gotta give him that. And, uh... The way the story is told is like is very well done, and you love the the tension that rise, and that's helped because Scorsese is just a great director, and the fact that you get all all of these amazing actors, you get Leonardo DiCaprio, is one of his like best performances. I, I think this might be actually his best performance. Uh, Matt Damon also, I think this is his best. I think this is the Damon's best performance. Uh, you got Mark Wahlberg also giving his best performance. I think Wahlberg should have, like, won the supporting actor for this role because he's amazing in this film. Uh, Jack Nicholson also amazing. Martin Sheen is also amazing. Uh, Alec Baldwin is also amazing. Uh, Ray Winston and v Vera Farmiga and Anthony Anderson. This is, like, I feel like sometimes this is missing in movies. Just, like, I want to... I just want a really good, like, ensemble cast movie where just everyone is just so, like, witty in their dialogue and they talk fast. I want, I want more movies like this that aren't superhero movies. I want, like, movie, like, I want action-packed, not superhero movies where they just have a great big ensemble cast of actors. And a great director, too. This, this definitely deserved, uh, Scorsese's win because it definitely, like, because I think the Oscars, they really looked at this film and it was just like, yeah, this movie is great. And rightfully so, it took the Oscar from Loma Sunshine. I think that's what people wanted it to win now. But after a lot of movies not winning the Oscars, especially Raging Ball and Goodfellas, which would have won, they gave it to this movie and it was about damn time. So coming in number two is Goodfellas. Yeah, everyone kind of thought I was going to put this at number one. Or maybe King of Comedy if I wanted to be cool. Uh, look, I don't really want to say anything more about Goodfellas. Because too many people have said it, how great it is. The directing is great. The writing is great. The chemistry between all the actors is great. I, I can't add anything else to it. It, this this movie, it just, all I can say is it just shows Corsese at the top. Like, because that's what I can say about the movie feel like. It feels like Scorsese just making his most Scorsese movie at the top of his game. And it's really fun. It's really energetic. It's never boring. I can't, I, I can't have, I can't say anything about it. De Niro... Pesci, Leota, uh, Paul Savino, well, yeah, both, both Paul Savino and Ray Liotta, rest in peace. And uh, I like the actress who, who plays uh, Karen, who's a real Karen. And uh, my dad would always tell me the dog, would always tell me the, what do you want from me joke, ever since I was five. So that's something I got from this movie. And, uh, you're probably thinking, what is the movie that I think is the best Scorsese film over Goodfellas, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, The Departed, King of Comedy? Well, here it is. 
You gotta sit down, everybody says so. No, I'm not sitting down, I can't do it! It's what it is. What it is. I know things they don't know I know. It's gonna happen. Either way, he's going. Yeah, you might not be surprised by this, but The Irishman is, def is my favorite Scorsese film. Everyone is just going to go, oh, that movie is so long. De Niro and Pesci look so fake. All right. Let's get this out of the way. The CGI, I don't have a problem with. The CGI is all right. Uh, I think it is just, it's, it's not bad, uh, it's not, it's, it's not great, because this, this came out the same year as, like, Captain Marvel, and I think that had, like, better, um, DH CGI, uh, but at the same time, though, the movie is so good, you don't even care, at, at, like, when you get into it. Like, you don't care that, uh, you know, it's not an accurate look of, like, Pesci or De Niro. You don't care, because you because you are sucked into the amazing writing by Steve Zillian. And uh, De Niro, Pesci, and Pacino. Also, with, like, Ray Liotta, and also uh, Stephen Graham, an actor. I don't know if he's, like, well-known. He's definitely not well-known in America. He's, he's more like a UK actor. I think this was like, like he was in, he was in Gangs of New York, and seeing him in this film, uh, cause this is my first time watching it since like I saw it back in like 2020 when I got Netflix for the first time, I didn't realize how amazing he is, Stephen Graham, and he just recently embarrassed himself by being in that Matilda movie, which I didn't think was awful, but I just kind of was like, I felt bad for Stephen Graham cause I think he was totally miscast, and watching him in this, I feel even more sad because he's great. He works well with De Niro and Pacino, and you don't really see him in stuff like this. Maybe like Boardwalk Empire, but I haven't seen Boardwalk Empire. Uh, and uh, and I know you people are gonna say the three out. It's three hours and thirty minutes. It's the I, I think it is actually the longest American film ever made. Okay, so who cares if it's three hours? I care if it's if the time is spent well with that three hours and 30 minutes. And you know what? This movie properly spends that time sparingly. Well, it's well thought out. There's not one scene in this movie that I go, well, this could have been cut out. Uh, yeah, I don't think you need this scene could have been like shortened. No, every every scene in this film feels necessary to the plot. Uh, and yeah, and people want to know why I really like this movie. Why do I like it more than Goodfellas? Uh, well, one, I, as much as I, I, you know, I'm more close to Goodfellas with, you know, where I live. Uh, this is in Pennsylvania. I think, the, like, what the mob does in this movie, because it's, it, they're more, like, connected with, like, the union and the government, and... I want to say, like, you know, like, it's a, it's a mob that feels more, like, scary. Like, if you feel like it's, like, the mob, like, that's controlling America in a way, because, you know, they're, like, they're, like, suspected of, like, being connected to the assassination of JFK, and, like, you know, they, were, they had something to do with the Bay of Pigs. It's definitely, like, I think these mobsters are, like, are more interesting and fascinating. Like the Russell, the, the Buffalino family, like, learning what he is, is definitely something, like, I feel like it's more interesting than whatever, like, Polly is and Goodfellas. And, uh, I think, I think just overall, I like the story and I like the characters. Maybe it just is that, like, maybe Goodfellas and Casino, uh, overall, they just, they needed Al Pacino in there to just be, like, yelling up a storm in there. Because, like, I, I, I don't think, like, I mean, we're never gonna get a movie like this. Which is why I like it. And we're never going to see a movie like where we have uh, De Niro, Pacino, and Pesci in a movie. Even though they're not really, they're never really on screen together. Like, J 
Joe Pesci and Pacino only have like one scene together. But and but De Niro and Pesci, they have like a lot of just great scenes together. Um, you know, being their sec their 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 third film together, you know, Heat, uh, I think is it Righteous Kill. It was like a movie no no one liked the uh, the other one where it was like them as cops. But luckily they made this movie and it's really it's it's really fucking good. Uh, and I just I like it's it's basically Scorsese after making um, Goodfellas and Casino when he was like you know in his late forties early fifties now it's him uh, making this in his like late seventies and it's now him looking at like a new perspective of like what it means to be like a gangster and what the cost is of just being a part of a mob and that you just become miserable with your life uh, everything uh, you had that you loved is just now gone it leaves you and how just nothing being in this like just being a part of the mob it leaves you nothing in life you become nothing which it's just it's very deep when you when you come to the end and it's just De Niro as this frail old man who just lost everything, and maybe that's why I like it because it's just how the choices in our life that we make they're always just going to uh, affect us in the long way, and so if we can just make better decisions of what we do, maybe we could be more happier than Frank Sheeran ever was at the when when he died. So maybe that's why I like it. It's just it can, it's it's a movie that I think anyone can just watch, and, and they it can be very personal to some people, and it can just you know, even if they're not gangsters, it can it's a movie that people can just kind of like feel, which is why I love, and uh, that's why I love The Irishman, and I think it's Scorsese's best film, and I think. And I think maybe the, the reason why people don't care about this movie as much as Goodfellas and Casino, I think it mostly has to do with the fact that it, it came out in 2019. And that was the year of movies that I think, like, had films that people, did, that people like, were blown away by. You know, you had uh, Parasite, 1917, Joker, um, Knives Out, did I say 1970 nights on that? Um, 40 Ferrari. Uh, just movies that were kind of a lot more like... Like when, when it came out, people wanted to see those more. People were talking about them more than this movie because of, oh, it's three hours long. It's too... It's too long. Wow. Imagine what they can see what... Like, what's coming out, you know, today. I feel like there's a three-hour movie coming out like every two months. There's so many three-hour movies today. When you look back, I think the only three-hour movies that were coming out was just Avengers, this, and I think It Chapter 2 was like 2 hours and 49 minutes, which is pretty long. So that's it. Like, compared to, like, 2022, we got Babylon, Batman, RRR, um, there was other, some, something else. Oh, yeah, Avatar, and, like... This year we had like Bo is Afraid and also Killers of the Flower Moon and Oppenheimer. So there's definitely a lot more like three hour movies than there was in 2019. But Irishman and like also Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I think both movies no one really talked about that much. I think looking back to that year, even like just like almost five years later, I think these movies, like those two movies, I, st I think they still like hold up better for me than like uh, 1917 or Joker. And that says a lot. So there you go. Those are my top 10 favorite Martin Scorsese movies. Oh, wait. People are going to want me to talk about Killers of the Flower Moon more because that's more recent. Um, <clears throat> Alright, so Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, I think overall... <clears throat> I can't talk because I've been talking about Scorsese, like ten of his movies. I I, I think it is it was all right. <laughs> uh, good production design. I, I like the look of it all. Um, I think DiCaprio and Nero give great performances. I also like Jim, Jesse Plemons. And I like at the very end when uh, Brendan Fraser and John Lithgow, you got two big actors, uh, come at like the last forty minutes of the movie. So that's kind of funny to like see them at the end, and they're good for like the scenes they got. 
Uh, and Lily Gladstone. Oh, Lily Gladstone, people are really like hyping on her. She thinks everyone thinks she's the best actress in the movie. She's probably gonna get the Oscar with how you know with like what what they do. What, what the Oscar does today. Uh and I think Scorsese's direction is still good. My main problem is the script. So here's the funny thing. This movie is four minutes shorter than The Irishman. And I think this should have had a lot of cuts to it. And that's funny because The Irishman's longer. And I think every scene in that movie deserve like, like, was great the way it was. But this film, I think maybe it could have used, like, it could have been cut down a lot. And... I think it's just going to suffer from the fact that it came right after The Irishman for me. And so watching The Irishman and then this, I think it's just, it has, this movie had a lot to live up to. But at the end of the day, when you look back at the directors from the 70s, you know, like Scorsese, Spielberg, Lucas, Coppola, De Palma, and uh, since like they're some, they're one of the few directors from that time, you know, like William Friedkin who just died, uh, Robert Altman, Robert, Robert Altman's dead. Everyone's like gone, or they're just because right now it's just Scorsese, with Spielberg. I know Coppola's kind of gonna make a comeback with his film Megalopolis. But time will tell with that movie if it's good or not. So right now, it's really it's just Scorsese and Spielberg, and I think Scorsese is doing a way better job making films than Spielberg is. And so I think even if I didn't like Coast of the Flower Moon that much, I still think Scorsese is my favorite director, and that's never going to change. So thank you for thank you guys very much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your favorite Scorsese films. And I'll see you next time where I'll rank David Fincher. Uh, that's going to be very exciting. All right. See you guys.